dialogue. Yeah. Okay. How much are moving on both campuses? So you're good We're to go. set. Yeah. Uh, welcome all of you to Meeting of Minds. Uh, this is a panel discussion. We have with us some uh, celebrated guests, which we're anxious to hear from. And our topic today will deal with education. Uh, the first thing we would like to do is have the panel introduce themselves and in their introduction give us uh, the basics of their philosophy as it relates to uh, the future of education and technology. Um, so I welcome all of you. Apologies to Steve Allen. Uh, and let's proceed. Why don't we start with uh, Coach Wooden. Hello all. My name is Coach John Wooden. Um, I was born on October, uh, October 14, 1910, and I died June 4, 2010. Um, my hometown is Martinsville, Indiana, uh, so I come from a very small farming town um, where basketball was my life growing up. Um, my father, Joshua Wooden, and my mother, Roxy Ann Wooden, um, were the two biggest influences in my life growing up. Um, and I've been married to my wife, Nellie, for over 60 years. Um, I started playing basketball at, in Indiana when in high school and was able to play in college at Purdue, where after that, I had a 27-year tenure coaching at UCLA. Um, I was able to win 10 national championships, seven came consecutively. I also had 88 games in a row, and I won Coach of the Year six times. And I had a lot of success coaching basketball at UCLA. But I think my greatest success came from being able to instruct young men on, um, on what it takes to be a man growing up and what it takes to be a citizen in life. Um, I'm a strict value theorist. Um, I have a pyramid of, of 16 different values that um, I believe everyone should follow in order to be a uh, upright citizen or, or a valued citizen um, in society. Um, those go with industriousness, friendship, loyalty, cooperation, self-control, alertness, initiative, intentness, team spirit, skill, condition, poise, confidence, and competitive greatness. Um, on top of that is faith and patience. Um, I believe that through hard work and determination that um, we are able to um, be successful in life. Now, my definition of success is that it's a peace of mind that is a direct result of, of the self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become you are capable of becoming. So success, my success on um, through coaching basketball, which is much like a, a metaphor for life for me, um, didn't come with all the national championships I've won eight games in a row. Um, my success is the peace of mind and knowing that um, I was able to teach these young men a little bit about what it takes to be successful um, in life. Um, at Purdue, I wasn't the greatest. Um, I wasn't the tallest. I wasn't the most muscular. But I learned through hard work and determination and my industrious industrious on the court that I was able to become the most the high the most highly conditioned athlete that my coach had ever um, had said had ever come through uh, Purdue University since his time there. So I really strongly value in, in the human capacity of being able to um, overcome our um, overcome our shortcomings and being able to achieve as much success as, as we are possible. And um, I'm not one to say that um, we're going to achieve everything in our life, but knowing that we prepared ourselves as best as possible to be successful in life um, is something that I really value. Um, that's about all for important work. Okay, thank you very much, Coach. Hermione. My name is Hermione Granger. If my name is familiar to those of you witches and wizards out there, that may be because you know my good friend Harry Potter's exploits, or read my new translation of the tales of the Be Beetle the Bard. Those of you muggles or non-magical persons might remember me from the seven volumes that tell of the formative years of my friend Harry Potter and our other friend Ron Weasley. Both of these friends will tell you that I spend too much time reading 
and it is through this reading that I now have a stance on the future of education and technology utilized in that education. I believe that technology, much like magic, can be an extremely useful tool for students. Even the current students at Hogwarts School for Witchcraft and Wizardry might find use for this technology if we could find a way to repeal the safety spell that causes any modern technological device to malfunction within the castle walls. Lord Voldemort might be vanished, vanquished, but as a former professor of mine, Alastair Moody, stated, constant vigilance is the key to any defense. In terms of ethics, I have read much of Aristotle in my ancient runes class, and yes, he was a wizard. And I agree with basing much of my personal ethics on his canons. Thus, based on all ab above evidence, my educational model, clearly no not decrees, would include pods of students doing individual work with a study pod for questions and an instructor for group work. My best work was done on my own and in collaboration with my two friends, Harry Potter and Ron Weasley, and I would often arrive at the best solutions to the problems or issues in learning. The instructor would be there for guidance and to ensure the safety and practices and legal practices of the students. There will also be different pods for different subjects in order to facilitate the student's interest and expertise. There would always be a leader in the group, a student strong in the subject and that shows aptitude towards teaching others. And this model would help shape future professors and instructors. If that student so choose, chose, they can move along the path to a future instructor, but only if he or she chose this for themselves. There would be no preconditioning going on in the classrooms, which is a proposition that I think would be very beneficial to both wizard and muggle societies. In my expertise, this changing of groups would cut back on rivalries between the pods of students and enable the students to get much more out of learning, as if they would not have the distractions of competition. While I found our system of house points to be beneficial towards encouraging me to learn to earn points, many professors and students, when given the opportunity to award and deduct points, would abuse the system in order to belittle students with point deductions and award favorites with more points than they legitimately earned. If there would be a point system, this would be on an individual basis and there would be no competition with other students, only competition with one's own self. Competition can be rather destructive in schools and this extends to standardized, te standardized tests that would place the focus on both inner student and also inter-school competitions. There would be a fixed amount owed to each and every student in the educational system regardless of their standardized test scores. Equality is the key to formulating a lasting system for educating both young witches and wizards and also for muggles. Very good. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker, Leon. Yes. Um, good afternoon, all. My name is Dr. Leon Cass. I, am, I was born and raised in Chicago. I graduated with my undergraduate degree, Bachelor's of Science from Chicago. Um, in Chicago, I got my medical doctorate in Chicago, and I um, left home to go to Massachusetts. I then graduated with a PhD from Harvard, um, returned back to Chicago, and been working at the university ever since. Um, my focus is on bioethics and biomedicine and uh, biotechnology and the future where it's leading with nanotechnology in regards to um, in regards to nanotechnology, uh, social thought is very big, um, and human dignity is of the utmost importance to me. Um, this, techno this technology exists, and we're all aware of that, and as it evolves, I don't want us to lose sight of where it's going. I don't want it to manipulate and take over us, and I want us to remember um, our moral compass, to continue to use technology as a resource, and um, if one day we wake up and the technology is telling us what to do or it's running our lives, that's something that I want to prevent, if possible. All right. uh, Tom Friedman. I'm Tom, Thomas Friedman. Um, I'm a journalist and author. Uh, I write for the New York Times. Um, and I, I know a decent amount of, about education. Uh, m mostly I focus on global markets, um, Middle East and environmental issues. Um, but of course, Education falls right in with every, you know, with that perfectly. So, um, and my, my wife's a teacher. She's been teaching forever in Maryland. She's a first grade teacher. Uh, my daughter just recently became a teacher in D.C. And um, and I have some some thoughts about the future of technology. And uh, and uh, some people may, may not be very comfortable with where we're headed as as a as a country in the United States. 
but we're shifting away from it. And I, I like to use that word a lot. It shifts and, um, and a lot of different movements um, that aren't, that are, are, are pretty technical in nature. For example, um, I'll be talking a lot about um, in, the intelligent curriculum, the intelligent curriculum planners, um, brick and click schools, um, major flatteners, like, uh, and, and, and tech stero steroids, which I like to call them, and like internet, voiceover, IP. Um, and I, I kind of see this as being best for society and, and everybody, because these students are starting to get really frustrated. Um, they've already given, they have no real, they don't see any major need to get out of the situation they're in. Um, China, you know, de um, last generation in countries such as China and India needed to improve themselves. They saw that, but a lot of these children don't s see the need to do that. Um, and they're getting frustrated in, the, in the schools. And we're not showing any, we're not showing that we are rewarding creativity or innovations. We're showing that we love um, number. Being able to crunch numbers is, is all that's important. And if you look at college dropouts like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, this is obviously not true. They're intelligent men, but they're also very creative and innovative. Next we have the verbose Isaac Asimov. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for um, having the panel this week. As we all know, um, National Robotics Week is next week, and since it you know, highlights my accomplishments, I told them I would speak for the second annual one, and I just c simply wouldn't be able to do both of them. So thank you for that. I do appreciate it. Um, my name is Isaac Asimov. You take the words him, as, hi, has, him, and of, put them together, just remove the H's. Um, and you have Asimov. It's Russian, which is suiting because that's where I was born. Um, I moved here when I was three. I can't speak any Russian, but I can speak Yiddish um, from my father. Um, growing up, my parents owned lots of candy stores, and that's when I first really fell in love with reading. Um, my father forbade me from reading pulp magazines that were sold at the store but it had the word science in it, so it was pretty easy to convince them that they were educational. Um, that's when I also just realized how good I was at telling the stories, because a crowd would often gather around me at school as I would just kind of repeat you know, the stuff I had read. Um, that helps me a little bit not sound as, um, makes me sound a little bit more coherent and hopefully not ramble in panels like this, although I still might do a little bit of that. Um, I uh, was a professor at Boston University, but primarily I write, and I write a lot, and this is what I'm known for. I'm gradually managing to cram my mind more and more full of things. I've got this beautiful mind, and it's going to die. It's all will be gone. And then I say, not in my case. Every idea I've ever had, I've written down, and it's all there on paper. And I won't be gone. I'll be there. So um, I've written a lot of things. I'll. Um, I'll just show you, show you just a couple of them. Here's for this side. Um, these are my books. This pretty much tells you everything you need to know about me, um, the catalog of what I've written. I've made the switch over to the typewriter, from the typewriter to the computer. Um, but I, I've just never had writer's block. Um, in fact, thinking is the activity I love best. And writing to me is simply th thinking through my fingers. I can write up to 18 hours a day, typing 90 words per minute. I've done better than 50 pages a day, and nothing interferes with my concentration. You could put an orgy in my office, and I wouldn't look up. <laughs> well, maybe once. Um, but it's paid off, because um, as you can see, I've written a lot. I'm not really sure how much. Um, but as far as education, I'm extremely disappointed in today's education system. Having so much technology at our disposal, I thought we would be so much further. We shouldn't have students as mind-numbingly bored as they are today. I figured that once we have computer outlets in every home, each of them hooked up to an enormous libraries where anyone can ask any question and be given answers, be given reference materials, be something you're interested in knowing from an early age, however silly it might seem to someone else, that's what you are interested in, and you can ask, and you can find out, and you can do it in your own home, 
at your own speed, in your own direction, your own time, then everyone would enjoy learning. But that's not how it is. Nowadays, people call, what people call learning is forced on you. Um, and I think that you need to have a say in it and that you need to be motivated. The other thing is just wanting to learn is something that's taught. And that's what my father, I mean, he really, he, he didn't know much, but he gave me the value to, edu to value education. Um, and that's what I think is the most important thing. Um, after writing a critical essay on Star Trek for TV Guide, I became good friends with Gene Roddenberry. And I found that Star Trek was a refreshing and intellectually challenging show. And I really found interest in the character Data. Um, I think it would be great if we could have other students like Data. Um, not only are androids or robots hardworking and determined, but they have superior logic. Um, and superior logic is vital because that provides superior ethics. Um, and as far as people being worried about having robots and technology in the classroom, I've, I've created a value system that is a realized value system that is internally consistent and has abstract um, exceptions. So the, the three laws that I created um, are not for my robot, the movie. They were actually first issued in my short story, Runaround. And it, the first one is that a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. The second law is that a robot must obey all orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first conflict. And the last law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And I've since amended a zero with law, but we can get to that um, later. I, I just think that there are many people that are scared to have robots in society. And these, po these people often assume that machines and computers dehumanize learning. And I believe it's just the reverse. It seems to me that through this machine, for the first time, we're able to have a one-to-one -one relationship between information source and information consumer. The part of the inhumanity Part of the inhumanity of the computer is that once it's completely programmed and working smoothly, it is completely honest. So I think that technology, yes, it comes with certain responsibilities, um, and there are, are tons of dangers, but it is our need to know knowledge that we need to um, have it in the workplace and especially in school. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, John. Uh, hello, thanks for having me here. I'm a little bit nervous after going after that because I'm not always the most graceful speaker. Uh, I have tendencies to kind of fidget and rummage through my papers and you know I've taught in a lot of colleges and it's common knowledge that um, I, I tend to stare off sometimes and um, I've been known even in my own lectures to, to kind of wander off and put my students to sleep. but. But that's okay. Um, you know, I don't want you to get discouraged when you hear me using the word lecture because 